is attached to them, camera sensors get cheaper and faster and smaller and higher quality all the time. The computers that process them get better and better every year and cheaper and smaller and lower power. And those are just on this curve of scaling like crazy that uh, I just think that, that this future that we've imagined for so long of like, physical computing or ubiquitous computing is, is arriving, but through cameras instead of through hardware. Uh, imagine over time as cameras scale up also what this will mean. You know, we're just, right now we're just talking about you know, mostly 640 by 480 low resolution cameras. And we have all these cameras that are getting better, higher resolution and more computation behind them and smaller and lower power all the time. The ability to have ever higher resolution sensors with ever more computation on them. That's scaling up like crazy in a way that embedded computing or physical sensors are just not. And if you really follow that line of thinking through, if you have high enough resolution with high enough color resolution, what you start to measure with a camera is not what things look like, but what things are. At a certain point, a camera of for a long time, like I studied um, the work of Doug Engelbart, um, who is one of the founders, the father, forefathers of, of com computing, um, did maybe more than anyone else, invented the, the graphical user interface um, at human augmentation. So instead of the computer really understanding and knowing things and being this artificially intelligent creature that you'd talk to and engage with like a person, like, um, like the robot from the Jetsons. His model was that it was a tool that amplified what you could already do, that amplified your reach or the, the reach of your voice or your intelligence or your ability to remember things. It just amplified those. So and, those. so, and things like machine learning and object recognition, those come out of that project of artificial intelligence. And, um, and I think we've imagined them as part of this like computer brain that works like a human brain. And I really don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's gotten any progress, really. But those actual techniques of object recognition and machine learning has gotten better. And they've really gotten good recently. Like Those are starting to come up not as intelligent robots that come around and understand our world, but as tools like Google image search and um, automatic tagging of Facebook photos and things like that. And so I things like that. And so I think that the way that those kind of um, what were artificial intelligence techniques are hitting the world is much weirder than we expected it to be. It's not just this encapsulated person over here who is a, basically a person but with a metal skin. It's these tools and environments, digital environments that we live our whole lives in and through, and that we don't even see or recognize as technology to some degree. Yeah, they're not entities. So object-oriented on, object -oriented ontology is a contemporary movement in philosophy um, that is about, so ontology is the study of what exists. It's the philosophical discussion of what exists. And object-oriented ontology says that, um, has what they call a flat ontology. So they say that everything exists. They try to overturn what would be a human-centered ontology. Um, would say that human beings exist and so do tripods and omelets and spaceships and planets and um, uh, horses and um, anti-aircraft guns and just everything. Everything exists equally. Um, and impact on people. We're constantly focused on how does this technology change social relationships and how does it, how does it mediate personal expression of identity. But Thinking about it that way leaves out the technology. It's very hard to think. And the more I looked into it, the more I realized there's this kind of trickle-down process of knowledge that happens. So like there's academic or corporate research somewhere into creating a new technique. Um, and then that gets published as academic papers or patents. And then that gets applied into software like um, you know, into an Autodesk program like Maya or Photoshop or something, or you know, uh, Adobe's Photoshop, or and then it kind of trickles down into maybe it's kind of into a game engine, and then um, and into end user products, and then creative coding and other artists pick up those products and make work with them, and creative coding people pick up those techniques and put them in libraries. But there's that that trickle down process is very slow. And as someone who's only receiving either of those tools, like you're only just a user of Photoshop or receiving the libraries that are made in your framework, in your language, you really have this passive relationship where all you can, so I really wanna, for myself, I wanna be able to have a relationship to that research. I wanna go find out what's in that research and choose from it based on my own artistic interests. Um, 
and be able to make it into libraries into my own projects directly without having to wait for that trickle down process. And I want other people to be able to do that too. I want to make it easier to start from being maybe like a little bit past the beginner, like intermediate level, and to be able to engage with that research and um, make your own tools. Um, a big part of the tools, um, a big part of the spirit of this community comes about making your own tools. Um, but right now we're kind of at the level of like sharpening sticks into into spears rather than you know chemistry and and, and physics and uh, real technology. So uh, it's a big problem. Now I would say like creative coding people, and I and I count myself in this camp are really exploring some set of issues that drive them, whatever that, can, whatever that is. Um, that can be anything from um, you know, the way technology changes our relationship with what's private and what's public, a question like that. That's a really broad theme um, that could be interpreted in, you know, in essays or in installation work or in, in films, like lots of different forms it could take. So somebody like that, two groups, in the form of, for example, this paper I just saw from a research group in Cambridge that's about tracking large numbers of people's gaze direction in public space. So you can take like a low res camera in Grand Central Station and know where hundreds of people are looking at any given time. You know, that, that's, that was solved by various academic and industrial and um, in intelligence applications. But for someone who's interested in privacy and public space, that might be really interesting. That technology might be really interesting for different reasons. And so they would come to is that it's about creating those relationships too. It's not just that one Superman emerges who stride, you know, straddles across all of those those um, those divisions. But instead, you know, I can meet Murphy Stein, who's a researcher, a PhD candidate in Ken Perlin's lab at, next door at NYU, and I can collaborate with him. Like he's working on finger tracking with depth images, and I can work with his code, and I can work with their system, and I can give them feedback, and I can apply it, and I can disseminate their ideas and figure out what they mean, and they and I can learn from them about the technical approaches, the the kind of the, their research, um, and that back and forth kind of creates like another a new person that doesn't really exist, who's smarter than the individuals that make it up. And that's, that's what, I'm, so uh, visual effects have been the driving thing for me. Um, and are, I love the aesthetics of visual effects, um, not always the way they're used in movies and the storytelling, but the, their, their aesthetics themselves. And, and I think they're a really powerful model for combining research and art um, that, I, that it can be emulated and, um, and this cre to create really this, empower this incredibly powerful visual ca capacity um, for storytelling or just really or iconic image making. Um, and that, um, imagine over time as cameras scale up also what this will mean. You know, we're right now we're just talking about you know, mostly 640 by 480 low resolution cameras and we have all these cameras that are getting better higher resolution and more computation behind them and smaller and lower power all the time. The ability to have ever higher resolution sensors with ever more computation on them. That's scaling up like crazy in a way that embedded computing or physical sensors are just not. And if you really follow that line of thinking through, if you have high enough resolution with high enough color resolution, what you start to measure with a camera is not what things look like, but what things are. At a certain point in programming, I was getting frustrated that it was hard to learn really some of the deep underlying things behind that. You know, you start off with drawing kind of simple shapes in processing or whatever, but there's like this really deep, awesome math that lets you do the more exciting things. You kind of, as a beginner,